Okay. So last talk uh, of this session is uh, a fast and simple uh, partially oblivious PRF with applications by uh, Nirvan Tiaji, uh, Sofia Tseli, Thomas Christenpart, Nick Sullivan, Stefano Tessaro, and Christopher Wood. And uh, Nirvan is here. Great, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nirvan. I'm a PhD student at Cornell University, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our recent work on building a new partially oblivious uh, pseudorandom function. So first, I'll start with some quick background on oblivious uh, pseudorandom functions, OPRFs. Um, at a high level, an OPRF allows a client holding a secret input x to compute a PRF evaluation keyed by a secret held by some other party, say a server. And so the client should learn only the single evaluation of its input and nothing else about the PRF or PRF key. Um, and the server shouldn't learn anything about the client's secret input. And then additionally, we can add verifiability on top of this where the client will hold a public key of the server and can then verify that the server performs this oblivious evaluation correctly. And so this OPRF primitive has become pretty hot as of late. Um, it's found homes in a bunch of different applications. And a few of these applications have started being deployed at, um, at large scale by companies like Google, Facebook, and Cloudflare. And some examples of where these large scale deployments have come in are, for example, in one-time use tokens for authentication, um, for bucketized private set membership for uh, password breach alerting, it's been deployed in the opaque system for password authenticated key exchange, and also in recent proposals for next generation um, online advertisement attribution. And so because of all this interest in OPRFs, the IETF has begun standardization of a particular construction called 2HDH. And this 2HDH construction is basically universally used across all of these deployed applications. And the construction is uh, actually quite simple. Um, it uses a cyclic group of prime order P, um, so it works well over standard elliptic curves. Um, the secret key is a random field element in ZP, and then the public key is this uh, G of the SK for some um, generator G. And so to send a request, a client samples a blinding factor R and sends H of, uh, it hashes its input X and blinds by this value R and sends that to the server. The server raises the request to the secret key and sends back this blinded response. Um, and then the client completes by unblinding the response and computing the final evaluation. And so then we can also um, add verifiability on top of this um, in a pretty simple way. And if we were doing that, the server would additionally produce this discrete log equivalence proof, um, proving that it raised the request to the proper power. And so here, the proper power is with respect to the public key. And this proof can be completed uh, very efficiently using, for example, um, a chom pedersen proof. And so this, um, this construction is the prevailing OPRF construction. Um, but then in this work, we're concerned with building a partially oblivious PRF, a POPRF. And so a POPRF is just like an OPRF, except it additionally allows for a public input component um, that I'm gonna call a tag. And so here now the PRF is evaluated on this combination of the public input tag as well as the client secret input. Um, and so again, the security properties are the same. The client shouldn't learn anything about the PRF key beyond the evaluation. Uh, and the server shouldn't learn anything about the client's secret input component. And then again, we can add verifiability on top of this. So what we've observed is that in all of these OPRF applications that I mentioned, um, a POPRF can be slotted in in place of an OPRF, and this extra ability, this extra power of the public tag um, can be used to simplify the application. Um, and then when we looked at prior existing POPRF constructions, uh, we found that either these constructions relied on pairings or didn't provide verifiability. Um, and that seemed to pose a barrier to adoption for these applications that were already using this um, efficient, verifiable 2HDH OPRF. So our main contribution then is constructing a new verifiable POPRF 
that's as efficient as this 2 hash dh OPRF. So it can be easily used as a drop-in replacement. So next I'll expand on one of these OPRF applications so you can kind of see where this like, given this extra power of the public tag, how we can uh, simplify um, deployments. So I'll focus on the authentication token application um, called Privacy Pass. Um, and this was one of the leading motivators for our collaborators at Cloudflare. So these content delivery networks like Cloudflare deliver a large uh, portion of the internet's content. Um, and, an, and an important function that they've uh, come to start uh, providing is uh, protecting their content hosts from denial of service attacks. And one way these CDNs protect against attacks by bots is by occasionally requiring a CAPTCHA before uh, completing a web request. And so really these CAPTCHAs are mostly required if the web request is originating from an IP address that's associated with bad actors. And so unfortunately that means that they mostly target users that are, um, um, are privacy conscious users that are connecting through websites like through the Tor network or using a VPN. Um, and so this means that these CAPTCHAs are like disproportionately affecting these privacy conscious users. And so what Privacy Pass does is once a user passes a CAPTCHA challenge once, a user can undergo an evaluation of an OPRF that's held by the CDN. And so the user will learn these evaluations, Y1, Y2, et cetera, for a batch of inputs, X1, X2. And then later on, when the user wants to make a web request, they can spend these tokens or these evaluation pairs, X, Y, um, to prove to the CDN that they passed a CAPTCHA in the past. And so the CDN verifier can verify that this X, Y pair is a valid evaluation. Um, and then the, it'll store X on a strike list to prevent double authentication. And then because of the oblivious evaluation um, property, the CDN can't link the token that's being spent to this time of oblivious evaluation at some earlier point by the user. And so this is a slightly simplified explanation of the protocol, but it gets the main idea across. Um, and Privacy Pass, this protocol, has been deployed by Cloudflare for a couple of years now. Um, and one thing that they've observed is an attack that can be mounted despite Privacy Pass's protection. And in this attack, malicious users um, that can pass the CAPTCHA, so these are human users, will hoard valid tokens over a possibly long period of time. Um, and after hoarding a sufficient number of tokens, they'll distribute these tokens across a botnet and then again, uh, mount a denial of service attack. And so since these tokens are valid, the CDN will allow these requests and the attack will proceed. So one mitigation against this token hoarding attack um, is to make tokens expire after some time frame, And this can be done by issuing tokens as an evaluation of an OPRF key that's only valid for some um, specified time epoch. And so here, uh, the malicious users can still hoard tokens over time, over many epochs, but come time to mount the attack at some later epoch, these tokens will have expired and will not be accepted by the CDN any longer. And so while this uh, per epoch solution works just fine, um, a deployment challenge is that key management of these uh, many per epoch OPRF keys is somewhat non-trivial. And without proper transparency infrastructure, where this mapping of which OPRF key is the proper OPRF key for which time epoch, if, if, without that being easily verifiable by users, um, users are potentially susceptible to tracking attacks by a malicious CDN. So instead, here's where um, POPRFs can come in. So we can draw this exact same picture as before. However, instead of using a different OPRF key for each time epoch, the time epoch information can be encoded as the public tag um, of the POPRF. And so this way, only a single POPRF key um, is required. And so actually what we find is that um, in almost all of the OPRF applications that we looked at, the same pattern of having uh, many OPRF keys emerges. And in all these cases, we show that a POPRF can be slotted in to simplify deployment somewhat. And so if you're curious about any of these other applications, uh, we discuss them uh, a little bit more in the paper. But then taking this motivation, um, we, look, we took a look at existing proposals for POPRFs. Um, so Pythia was the first proposal for a POPRF. It was proposed in the context of password hardening, but it uses pairings. And what we found when chatting with practitioners about deploying Pythia 
Um, it became clear that this use of pairings ended up being a large barrier for many of them. And in particular, it seems that the main barrier was that uh, was lack of wide library support, particularly in uh, crypto cryptography libraries for the web browser, which was a big concern that was cited. Um, and then the only other proposal is a general transform that transforms any OPRF into a POPRF by generating a per tag OPRF secret key using a PRF evaluate on the tag. So here um, I'm showing this transform applied to a two hash DH OPRF um, where I'm using a hash H3 as the PRF. And so unfortunately this transform doesn't provide efficient verifiability. Um, the server would have to prove correct evaluation of this hash H3, which would likely require pulling in more expensive general circuit based proof systems. And so then that left us thinking whether we could build a verifiable POPRF from just a discrete hard log group. And so I'm giving this talk uh, because we found the answer to that to be yes. And so here's the construction that we end up proposing. Um, we call the construction three hash SDHI. Um, for the three hashes that are in the construction and also for the strong Diffie-Hellman inversion structure. And it combines aspects of two existing PRFs. Um, the dodas yampolsky PRF strategy is used for encoding um, the public tag. And it also provides this algebraic structure that we can use to provide proofs of verifiability. And so this is in contrast to that generic transform that was encoding the public tag using a non-algebraic hash function. And then on the other hand, we use the two hash DH OPRF strategy to encode the secret input and also to perform a blue evaluation. And so this is how three hash SDHI maintains similar efficiency characteristics of two hash DH, which is um, a really nice property. So we can look at this protocol a little bit more closely. The beginning of the protocol remains the same. A client samples a binding factor and blinds this hash of X value. And the main difference now is that in blind evaluation, instead of the server raising to this power of the secret key, uh, as in 2 hash dh, the server will instead raise to this Diffie Hellman inversion value as in the Dodas Yampolsky PRF. So this is the one over SK plus um, hash of tag value. And then it completes the same. The client unblinds the response and um, it computes the evaluation. So and then again, we can add verifiability on top of this using the same discrete log equivalence proof. Um, the elements are a little bit different here because of this different inversion structure. Uh, compared to 2 HDH, but the, we're still able to use, uh, instantiate this discrete log equivalence proof using this efficient uh, Chom Pedersen um, proof. And so the main takeaway I wanted to make here is that uh, the evaluation is really just a minimal delta away from the standards track uh, 2 HDH OPRF. Um, and due to its similarity, 3 hash SDHI is being incorporated as an optional mode into the um, 2 HDH OPRF standardization effort. Uh, great. So it might seem from what I just uh, presented that 3 hash SDHI is a relatively straightforward combination of 2 hash DH and the Dodos Yampolsky PRF. And while that is true and it's what gave us all these nice properties, it turns out that the security analysis was not a straightforward combination of the existing analyses. So next I'll try to give a little bit of high level intuition on um, where these challenges in the security analysis arise and how we resolve them. And maybe before that, I'll also mention briefly um, that these new techniques that we come up with also provide the first proof of security for um, a closely related partially blind signature scheme that's based on, uh, that's based on pairings. And as far as we know, um, this is actually the most efficient partially blind signature scheme to date. And so this result may be of, um, of independent interest. Great, so in our analysis, um, we introduce new property-based security definitions for POPRFs and OPRFs. Um, these new definitions provide an alternative to um, the ideal functionality universal composability definition for OPRFs, which was before this the only existing security definition. And then in this analysis, the main uh, analysis challenge was in proving um, our pseudo-randomness uh, game of three hash SDHI. And so, um, in the pseudo-randomness game, it captures indistinguishability of the PRF from a random function, even against malicious clients that are given access to an oblivious evaluation oracle. So to prove the pseudo-randomness of 3 hash SDHI, we introduce a new interactive assumption that we call the one more gap um, SD, uh, strong defeat Hellman inversion assumption. Um, and we provide a relatively straightforward standard model reduction of 3 hash SDHI's 
uh, pseudorandomness security to this new OM gap SDHI. And then the main technical challenge that we need to overcome is in proving hardness of our new proposed assumption. And so for that, we provide a reduction in the algebraic group model to Q discrete log. Or more precisely, we go through this intermediate Uber assumption um, that was proposed by Bauer, Fuchs, Bauer, and Loss recently um, that lets us abstract some of the messy details of the AGM proof into an argument about linear independence of the group elements in the game. And so I'll focus for the remainder of my talk on this main technical challenge uh, and provide some intuition for how this algebraic group model analysis um, for our new assumption goes. So here's a simplif simplified version of the one more strong Diffie-Hellman inversion game. I'm omitting the gap decision oracle to simplify the presentation a little bit. Um, and in this game, the average is given g of the x, where x is playing the role of the secret key, and then m challenge points g of the y1, g of the y2, through g of the ym. And they're also given access to this evaluation oracle that provides strong Diffie-Hellman inversion evaluations, which, so on an input element b um, and tag t, the oracle will provide this uh, b to the power of 1 over x plus t evaluation. And then the adversary is tasked with providing a set of c values where each c is a valid strong Diffie-Hellman inversion evaluation for some y one of the challenges. And then the adversary must provide more C values for some specified tag T um, than would be trivially computable by querying the evaluation oracle. So for the sake of time, I won't go into the details of the pseudorandomness security reduction, um, but intuitively this assumption um, captures what we want out of the PO pair F security, whereas um, a query to the blind evaluation oracle for a particular tag allows the client to learn exactly one pair of evaluation for that tag and not any other evaluations for any other tag. So in proving the hardness in the AGM rejection to the Uber assumption, we need to argue that at least one of these winning C elements that the adversary produces is linearly independent from all the other elements that the adversary has received from the SDH Oracle. And to do this, we need to reason about the types of elements the adversary can get from the Oracle. So obviously it's easy for the adversary to compute Q SDH elements from Q queries to the Oracle for tag T. Um, what's hard is we need to argue that making queries to other tags doesn't help the adversary compute another winning element for tag T. And so this independence argument um, becomes especially difficult when the adversary so-called mixes tags where they might pass back an evaluation that they already received from the Oracle for some tag T1 back to the Oracle to another tag T2. And so I'll expand a little bit on this like idea of mixing because resolving this is our main technical hurdle. So here I'm showing a transcript of queries that an adversary might make to the SDH Oracle. Um, here, if an adversary queries element B1 under tag T1, uh, they'll receive this evaluation response R1 that takes this form. Similarly, if an adversary queries element B2 under tag T2, they'll receive R2. Now, in query three, consider if the adversary submits an input B3 that includes a response from query one. So here I'm showing in B3 that R1 is in, included in the form of B3. So this is a repeated query, but it doesn't mix tags. Query one was to tag one, and query three is also to tag one. So I'll show that when we don't mix tags, it becomes, we, we can handle this relatively easily. Our challenging scenario comes when we mix tags. So here I'm showing another query three that mixes responses from both query one and query two, which were to different tags, tag one and tag two. Um, and this results in a response that has this mixed term in the exponent. And so in our reduction to the Uber assumption, we need to show linear independence of these exponents. And it's these mixed terms that end up causing us some problems. So now consider again um, the repeated query without the mixed terms. Now I'm just going to show the exponents because for the uh, in the Uber assumption we really just need to worry about these these rational fractions. Um, and so it turns out that without mixed terms, the independence argument is somewhat easy. We know that the adversary can only create two evaluations under tag T1 and one evaluation under tag T2. And so here are the here's the more challenging case: the mixed query transcript. The independence argument of these rational fractions isn't so clear. And in particular, it isn't clear if this mixed term uh, will be helpful to produce a new evaluation for tag two, even though only one query to tag two was made. Um, so our insight is that we can rewrite this mixed query three, 
expression to an unmixed query that will be more that'll be easier to reason about polynomial independence. So here I'm showing a rewriting of query three in a new rewritten transcript. Um, and in this new rewritten, the denominators are unmixed. So they only have tag one in the denominators, right? And so we show that it's possible to find these alpha one, alpha two, alpha three coefficients in such a way that the span of the original transcript and this new rewritten transcript are the same. And so then going back to by a similar argument that we uh, kind of claimed for this unmixed repeated uh, queries, we can show that this new rewritten transcript, which also has unmixed denominators, um, um, has a linear independence argument. So we can say that there's only two evaluations for tag two and one evaluation for tag one. Um, and then um, we show that since this rewritten transcript and the original transcript um, have the same span, this linear independence argument carries over. And so by this unmixing strategy, we can say something about our original transcript. And so we kind of generalize this argument as the main lemma of this, um, of this proof of our new assumption. And so by induction, we argue that at each adversary query, as long as the transcript of previous queries are unmixed, the new query, which could possibly be, unmi which could possibly be mixed, can be rewritten as unmixed in such a way that the um, two transcripts preserve the same span. Um, and so that's what we need to use to complete the independence argument that's needed for the Uber reduction. And so that's, the, that's what I wanted to say about the technical details of our um, hardness argument. And so I'll wrap up by summarizing um, some of the impact that 3 hash SDHI has begun to have. Uh, we evaluated our reference implementation. It confirms that 3 hash SDHI is quite practical. It's encouraged just a minimal overhead over 2 hash DH. And there's been a good amount of interest from companies that have deployed OPRF applications that would like to slot in POPRFs instead. Um, so because of that, um, I mentioned before, 3 hash SDHI is being integrated into the ongoing OPRF standardization effort. And one of our co-authors, Chris Wood, has been leading that effort, and we'd love to solicit reviews if, um, if you're interested in um, this construction or in any of the applications that I, that I mentioned. And so with that, I'll conclude, and thank you, and happy to answer any questions. Any question? Actually, I may have one. So in your analysis, uh, you, you assume that you can query uh, an oracle with t, and you get uh, the power 1 over x plus t. That's right. But in the protocol, t is hashed. So is the hash necessary? That's right. So the hash, I, I glossed over those details a little bit. Um, so in the reduction from the pseudorandomous game to the OM uh, gap STHI game, we do use the random oracle because we need to um, commit to the set of T values that are uh, part of the OM gap STHI game. So we choose them ahead of time, and then when the um, pseudorandomous adversary queries tags, we program the random oracle to our uh, pre chosen values for the reduction. Okay. And in the protocol, why is the proof uh, optional? So you mentioned that we can add the proof or not. Uh, so some applications don't require the client to verify that the, so it depends on the application. It depends on what the trust model is between the users who are doing a bullet evaluation and the uh, party that's holding the um, OPRF key. Okay. Um, if you remove the proof, you lose the unlinkability, right? Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's very important for the privacy pass uh, application. So that's why verifiability was one of the um, uh, properties that we were, that we wanted of our POPRF. Otherwise, that unverifiable POPRF with the generic transform would have been sufficient. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank, thank you. you.